Hello, and we're live. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Gelson, founder of VoiceLessons.com. And with me today, I have Dr. Matt Edwards. Matt, welcome to the show again. Hey, thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. Well, I always say this, but this really is my favorite time of the week because it's the time that we get to connect with our audience and actually take real questions that came in from singers and teachers that are out there that are just wanting to learn more. So this is our time to listen to you and, and answer some of your questions. So I'm going to go through the first question. Let me pull it up here. Question number one tonight comes in from Mark. So Mark writes in, if your voice is naturally nasal, how do you tone it down to being less nasal? Good. I so, know we've yeah. talked about this before, but I always love it when you pull up the models, Matt. So, I would say it's time to uh, pull up ahead. Let's pull and, up uh, ahead there. <laughs> Zoom on so, in. Here we go, Mark. I'm going to first, I'm going to take you inside of your voice. Is you need to know how the voice works in order to get it to work in the way that you want it to. So this is what we call a cross section of the head. And this is as if we just divided the head right here uh, down the front and across the nose. And when you then would open up the head, you would be able to see the inside. So this is the brain up here. And this is the spinal cord that comes down. Back here in the back, you can see red. These are the postural muscles of the neck that help our neck move in different directions. And uh, uh, the spinal cord's there. But these are what are called the cervical vertebrae. And the cervical vertebrae are what sit right behind what we call your vocal tract. Now, your vocal tract starts down here at the vocal folds. Actually, we could consider this uh, trachea part of it as well because the trachea uh, is what sends air up. Then we hit the vocal folds. Technically, we call everything from the opening of the vocal folds to the opening of the lips to the vocal tract. Uh, we have sound then that starts leaving these vocal folds, and then it needs to make its way out of the body. And this little thing right here is called the soft palate. And if you look in your mouth, uh, take a flashlight and say, ah, and look in your mouth, you'll see the dangly little thing swinging in the back of your throat. And that is the uvula. And that uvula is part of the soft palate. Now, when the soft palate is down, you'll see that uvula just dangling, may even almost touch the tongue. And in that position, sound can go up through your nose and can get cut off. And that's what we tend to perceive as nasality in the voice. Uh, if we lift that soft palate, sound can exit up and out over the hump of the tongue, out through the lips, and that's what's going to give us a, a non-nasal sound in our voice. Now, there are things that people will do in their throat. Sometimes if their larynx is too high, it narrows spaces in there, and it can create a nasal-like sound. So if what I'm telling you doesn't work, you know, email us back, let us know, and then I can give you the second part of it. So the first part of it is getting that soft palate to be able to lift. And so the first thing I want you to do is just go in a mirror and get your flashlight and look in your mouth and say, ah, and see if your soft palate's dangling, which I'm guessing it is. And then if you can see uh, the little uvula down, see if you can imagine that somebody was giving you a strep throat test where they try to swab the back of your throat and they say really open wide and go, ah, and see if you can't lift that uvula up in the air. Now, this might put too much strain on your jaw. Uh, if it does, then you don't need to do this step. Just uh, narrow it down a little bit until it's comfortable. See what you can see and just make some sounds and watch how the soft palate lifts and moves around. If you are able to get it to lift up in the air, I want you just to hold it there for as long as you can without even making any sounds. So you're just breathing in, getting that soft palate up and holding it. It's like an isometric exercise for the soft palate muscles. It's teaching them how to contract and to uh, lift up and close off the nasal port. Now, as you um, close off that nasal port, you should, uh, if you add sound to it by like putting a sigh in there, mind that the nasality completely disappears as soon as you get that palate up in the air. So what you want to do is uh, test that by pinching your nose shut. So if you're going, ah, and you pinch your nose shut and some of the sound gets cut off, ah, like that, then that means the sound is going up into your nose. That means your soft palate is not up. But if I've done my soft palate lift and then I sigh through it, Ah, ah, and I pinch my nose shut, you should notice no difference. That means your soft palate's up. So the next step after you've just taken a look to even see what it looks like inside of your mouth, try to see if you can even lift it up in the air, try to sigh through that sound. We want to start adding a consonant that's going to help you lift that palate and then move into a vowel. So for this, I like to start with pa or ba. We'll try both of them and see which one works best for you. So since you're just watching at home, Mark, try both. 
you're going to start with just a simple pattern like a do me so me do and when we're doing that it's a one three five pattern we're going to put the p in front of the ah and we're going to really let our cheeks puff up at first because when that happens that elevates the soft palate for you if it didn't elevate the soft palate all the air would just go through your nose so we know that p gets the palate up then what we're going to try to do is maintain that lift on an ah valve pa 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 it's really hard to get pa like as i do it i gag and choke because my soft palate's doing things it's not meant to do so i have found that unless there's some abnormality this exercise always works and so p or b ba 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 and practice that and you should start to notice this nasality go away then as you start feeling like that palate's starting to lift easily and the B's and P's get softer, and we start off with the big poofy one, the pa, but eventually we just want pa, 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 small piece. Then what we're going to want to do is start sustaining the vowel. Pa, 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 pa. And as you sustain, just try to keep that lift. Again, if you need to check, you just pinch your nose shut uh, and you'll be able to tell. So if I go, Pa, nothing changes. I know that my soft palate stayed up. And then after you've gotten it to stay up in a simple exercise, go through a song you like and sing that song on pa. And then after you've sung it on pa, try putting the words back in. And as you do this, alternating between the P and the B, doing the mirror work, going over to the vowel, you're going to start to gain a better awareness of what it's like to have that elevated soft palate. And before you know it, it's just going to become an automatic part of what you do. And then as you alternate between the pa or the ba on the notes of a song you like in the lyrics of the song, you should see some uh, improvement starting to creep its way in. Keep doing these exercises until you get the nasality balance that you're looking for, and you should be good to go. I was going to ask, Matt, I didn't want to interrupt you, but what happens if I'm like trying this at home and I try the pa or the ba? And I can't, I'm stuck. Like I cannot get the soft palate to go up. Do I just put my finger in my mouth and push it up or? <laughs> no, but what you might want to do is see, do you, you know, it's usually something like people have tonsillitis or some sort of tonsil problems that are really dragging it down or issues with their adenoids. And so if you're finding that these exercises don't help and you have chronic nasality, ask your doctor the next time you see them because they can look. Sometimes you have a deviated septum or some other abnormality that's in the way of the soft palate doing what it needs to do. And if that's the case, then you're going to want to have the doctor help you get that addressed. But again, that's why I say most of the time, unless there's an abnormality, you want to keep working on the P's, working on the B's, and uh, you should start seeing some improvement. Got it. So, so the soft palate should essentially move to where it needs to go without me really trying to do anything once I can get it to lift. Yeah, and that's a good point, Mike, is that not everybody watching tonight needs to do this work. In fact, if you get your soft palate up too high all of the time, you can start to sound a little fake and artificial when you talk <laughs> or you sing. And we don't want that either. So you want to make sure that you're not trying to jerk it way up. But since Mark specifically wrote in about nasality, this is the thing to uh, you know focus on until the nasality starts to go away. But yeah, in answer to your question, Mike, everybody's going to have different likes, dislikes, and every style is going to need uh, something a little different. In some rock styles, a hint of nasality can actually uh, make it easier to get the note, easier to get that kind of an electric metallic sound, and is the safer, healthier way to go about it versus trying to make those sounds just from your throat. Great, great. Okay, Mark, hopefully that helps you. Let's jump into our next question for tonight. This one comes in from Sammy. Sammy, thanks for writing in. This she asked, what's the difference between a voice coach and a voice teacher? And you know, a lot of people will come in and they say, I don't know the difference. Which one do I need? You tell me. So I just wanted to cover this one. So it's a common question that comes in. Sammy, again, thanks for writing in. Yeah. Um, so in in general is the key word here. In general, a vocal coach helps you with interpretation of songs. And in general, a voice teacher helps you with the technique of songs. Now, there are people who do both. And so that gets a little bit tricky because what do you call yourself if you do both? I do both. You know, so I, you know, it's kind of tricky. I, I consider myself a, a vocologist or an evidence-based practitioner. 
when it comes to voice technique because I use the science to inform your choices. But, you know, I have a, a, a very uh, deep acting background, lots of study, lots of teaching of acting classes and lots of work on the stylistic side of music as well. And I believe that storytelling leads the stylistic side and they have to complement each other in genre specific ways. So I really live at that intersection. So sometimes I'll just write that I'm a voice teacher and coach uh, since I live in both of those worlds. Other people choose to just call themselves a coach. Well, for my professional clientele, I'm not really teaching them anything like uh, big. They're already working in a Broadway tour or a national tour. I'm just kind of coaching them on whatever it is that they need. So even though I'm doing vocal technique work, that's kind of more of what I'm doing is I'm coaching them with a little bit of technique and style to help them unlock things versus uh, somebody who's just learning how to belt. And I'm really am kind of teaching them, hey, this is the way to build a voice strategically from the bottom to the top. So even I interchange some of these names. So what I would say, uh, Sammy, is that if you feel like you really like the sound of your voice and what your voice already is doing, and it feels easy and there's not any uh, necessarily sounds that you're really wanting to make that you're not already making. But you just know that sometimes within specific songs, you don't quite hit a note the right way or you feel like it just sounds a little flat or dull and you wish you could come up with a way to, you know, bring it to life. Or you feel like you need to really get somebody else to listen to your style and to listen to what you're doing and give you some feedback. I would look for a coach. Um, I think a coach is probably going to give you more of uh, that angle. And so you would want to look for vocal coach when you do your Google search or whatever uh, other platform, or of course, uh, reach out to voicelessons.com and go through our search and we can do a teacher match with you and match you to a coach. Um, but we want to pick one of those coaches up and then uh, see where that goes. Uh, ideally, it's nice when you can find a coach that knows some about voice technique. That way, if it does become a technical issue, they can offer you something uh you know useful in that moment and then on the uh, other side you know if you feel like you do have a lot of work things hurt notes don't come out the way that you want you want to expand your range then what you're going to want to try to do is find one of those voice teachers somebody who is a specialist in evidence-based voice uh, pedagogy and again that means that they're looking to the science to the research and they're trying to use facts to inform what they do and not just teach you based off of the way that they themselves learn to sing so, Sammy, I hope that helps a little bit. Coach, storytelling style, teacher, technique, many do both. And what they call themselves when they do both will vary. So pick a term that you think most closely aligns with what you need. Jump onto our platform and do a search for coaches in your, uh, and teachers that are available. And then start reading through their bios and their background and what else they've done to see who seems to match uh, what it is that you're looking for. Okay. Awesome. Sammy, hopefully that helps you. I'm going to pause for a second, Matt. We've got uh, some chat questions that have come in Great. from some live attendees. So uh, we always love it when the live questions come in. Um, first one I'm going to flash up here. Um, Metropolitan. Yes. Um, okay. Hi, Dr. Matthew Edwards. Is it true that vocal folds are not meeting together in M2 voice register? If yes, how do counter counter tenors make their voices loud with this voice register? Thank you. So, no, they are meeting together. They're just barely vibrating. If they're not meeting together, you just get that breathy wispy. Ah, ah, and you might vibrate the edge of them but it doesn't feel good and it doesn't sound good. So no, they're lightly closing together and they are producing harmonics. That's the way we even hear the pitch. We need that vibration. It's the mucosa, the uppermost layer of the epithelium of the vocal folds that when it comes into contact uh, with the other side, remember they're a bilateral pair. Um, when they come together, that's when we get uh, the vibrations to be emitted from the airflow because the vocal folds themselves are breaking up the air and it's breaking up the air at a certain rate that will start to create that oscillation that gives us pitch. So we need them to come together, but lightly, not as we would see in mode one where it's more thick. Um, I really have started moving more and more away from all of those, uh, even uh, definitions, mode one, mode two, chest and head to breathy and full. Because we many times we end up associating head with high notes, but high notes don't have to be breathy, like you're saying with uh, a counter tenor. So a counter tenor gets the right ratio to produce the kind of harmonics they need, and then they start to form their vocal tract around it to resonate it. 
So if I just get a, that's got enough closure to get me into more of a countertenor sound. I'm not a professional countertenor as you're about to see. But if I do make a resonance adjustment on it, it will start to change it a little bit and give it more of that ump that you're talking about. So going from, it's that kind of a thing that they're doing. They're rounding out their resonance. Now look, like I said, I'm not a professional countertenor. So mine is not refined at all. And I don't really have the instrument to do that. But when you find somebody who does, that sound that comes out is going to be the quality that you're talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, but, you know, again, just always making sure there is some vibration, some coming together of the folds. Otherwise, you may end up with incomplete closure and that can cause as much harm uh, to your vocal health as too firm of a closure. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Metropolitan, hopefully that helps you. I'm going to jump to our next question. This one comes in from uh, Linda Kumi. Hello, Matt. Please, how do I zip my vocal cords when I'm singing high notes? I love this question. So immediately I think registration. So I can't yeah. wait. So yeah, so this is a registration thing. So Linda, there used to be a thought that the vocal folds zipped up as you went up higher in your range. And that's because the equipment, there is a certain teacher of a certain method who was trying to research their work. They were doing all the right things back in the 70s and 80s. And when they looked at a stroboscopy, it looked like the vocal folds were closed at one point, like in the lower part, and then they kind of uh, got more and more closure as they elongated. So it almost it was a, a look of zipping of the vocal folds. Now, the Journal of Singing did a whole article about recent research and outcomes on this and what is widely recognized, and I've never seen any videos to the contrary, is that the vocal folds don't actually zip, that it was an error in the technology of the time and it was uh, you know, something that they've since figured out. And now we can slow the vocal folds down to watch almost, what is it like? I can't remember how many thousands of frames a second. And we can really see the action of the vocal folds and there's no zipping action. So what I want to focus on is though how to keep that closure. Because essentially what this method was trying to do is come up with a terminology and an explanation for not letting the vocal folds fall apart when we go up. Which is usually that ah. Right. You're trying to learn how to go. Ah, and some people feel the stretch of those vocal folds and that can feel like that zipping action. And so I think it's also important, though, to say is that like if the zipping imagery yields the result that you want, then awesome. Zip your vocal folds up. Right. <laughs> we all have to find what works for us. So I just want to kind of clarify that that did. They had good reason to name it that. We have some evidence to the contrary now. If it works, it's okay to use. But what sure. we hear really, on, yeah. on the zipping part, I just want to clarify. So maybe it's not zipping up, but you're 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 using less vibrating mass. You're decreasing yeah. the amount that's actually of the glottis that's actually vibrating. It may not just be a zipper. It might be in the middle. It might be at the top. It might be wherever they happen to be vibrating. Yeah. So it's more of a vertical change in phase. So like a thick fold versus a thin fold. So that also could be like a zipping action of zipping it up or unzipping it. But it's not the top view that we see when you're watching videos of vocal folds move. It's not right, zipping right, that right. way up the fold. But what Mike is saying is correct is that we have different modes of vibrational mass. So we have the ah uh, mode where it's really buzzy. And then we have the light and breathy mode. Ah, where the vocal folds barely touch. We have modes in between like ha ah, or ha ah, or ha. Ah. And all of those changes are happening vertically. Air comes up from the bottom of uh, the lungs or it comes from the lungs up to the bottom of the vocal folds. It slowly blows open the bottom of the vocal folds. They burst open, clap back together, and we get this action taking place. So in that way, you know, that is a, a, a narrowing and a changing. Got what it. You're and, and one other point, on it, it's not just the vertical. They still, like you said, they have to stretch. So you yes, still they're have stretching at the same time. They still have a horizontal component. It's, you know, it's 3D, right? But a lot of people will use the, the 2D scissor idea. That's a great point, easy, Mike. It's easy to understand. But you, you got it coming from a, a vertical depth and you've got the length 
that's being, being stretched. Elongating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the vocal folds are elongating and as they're elongating, you're trying to regulate their thickness. And so Linda, that is actually where if we're going to try to accomplish this uh, zip idea of getting the voice to carry up a sound, we have to try to train our body how to regulate all those movements. Okay. So again, we have one muscle trying to pull the vocal folds long, and then you have about three, four muscles trying to coordinate how firmly closed together they are. And that takes some uh, coordination. And the best way to do this is with glides. And to start off in a nice firm closure, usually the easiest way to get into firm closure is to go to the lowest part of your voice. Ah, uh, because that's a natural place for us to get that firm closure. And then what we want to do is feel like as we glide up, if we start with this thick closure, that we slightly let more air through, right? Because when we're here, not a lot of air can get through. When we start getting more uh, or less mass, more air will feel like it's going through because there's less pressure on the vocal folds themselves. We want to feel like we start letting a little bit more air through and we thin things out as we glide up to carry that sound up to the top. Ah. Now I'm not really controlling my vowel, so I'd want to make different vowel choices up there for an actual, you know, uh, a song, but that's that action. Ah. Carrying it from as low to high as possible. Because otherwise what happens is you get ah and we lose. And in that moment, the vocal folds do kind of pop open in the back. You'll see a little gap open up in the back. We call it the posterior chink. That posterior chink is what we want to kind of keep closed as those vocal folds elongate. So if you're having a hard time with this, you want to make sure that you're spending time developing and coordinating your chest register, which is that mode of singing where the vocal folds are firmly closed together. That's that ah. Do that in the comfortable parts of your range. Don't take it too high. And that exercise is going to get those folds closing a little bit more firmly. You can do staccati, ha, 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 to get them to close firmly as well. And then you can go staccati into a sustained note and then glide that up. Ha, 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 You have to lighten up a little bit because if you don't, you'll start yelling. Ah, and it'll sound bad and it won't feel good. So you're going to have to lighten up. At first, that lightening up is going to feel like your volume changes ever so slightly. You're going to feel like it might get a little bit breathier. But over time, you're going to gain more and more control of it. And before you know it, you'll be able to easily carry an even tone from bottom to top. Ah, transitioning as you need to in order to navigate your range. So, Linda, I hope that helps. Um, I've had this question pop up before, and it does confuse a lot of people. But again, I think just getting into doing glides it can really start to just help you get the results you're looking for. And then whatever we want to name it, I'm fine with it if you like the sound. Yeah, there's one extra thing I was going to add here. You know, glides are great, but a lot of pe some people, not everyone, uh, you're not even ready to do a glide. You try the glide yeah. and your voice cracks, you know, or you have a break. So for that, you can use like a lip trill. So it's like an even simpler one, but we're going to take away the vowel. We're going to take away a little complication of what we're actually doing on top of the registration. So just do a lip trill and glide on a lip trill and yep. start to work that for a couple of weeks. And once you get a glide on a lip trill, then you can go add in the, the vowel to it. There's one other thought that came up on this, Matt, and I was like, is it also when you, when you actually are trying to get the higher notes, you have to shift your registration from um co coordinating it right where you've got to shift the the balance being more muscular to the ligament right mm -hmm. yep. so I, I was wondering i think that's where a lot of people get tripped up on the break because they don't have a, enough coordination so something's gonna let go and then they get the break and they're like how do i get my high notes yeah and some, like you said light you got to lighten up but some people don't even know how to approach lightening up great so, so one of the easiest things to do is to start on a single pitch trying to teach your body how to lighten up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start on a pitch and we're going to go breathy first. And then we're just going to pulse the breathiness. Right there, you're taking thin folds and making them thicker. And then you're going back and doing the same. Now we can start pulsing backwards. Ah, 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 ah. Just 
just doing those little pulses. You're thinning out now. You're starting full and you're thinning out until they're really light and breathy. After we figured out this pulses, we want to try to go from our breathiest sound to our fullest sound on a single pitch, like this. Then, after you've mastered that, you want to go back the opposite way. After you can get it to go from that full to breathy, then we're going to put them together. Now, if anywhere along the way you start getting problems, just start making small shifts. See if you can go, ah, then go, ah, then go, ah, then go, ah, 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 until you can get it to work. Then we're going to go breathy to full to breathy. breathy to or full to breathy to full ah, and uh silence the cell phone over here <laughs> but um that's how you get it moving so then you've already coordinated your voice how to do that thinning out so then as we do a glide we get that same idea going from the fuller sound to the lighter sound ah, like that over the glide great so those are several different ways that you can practice zipping um pato just commented i don't know if you want to speak to this real quick pato says lightening up confuses me with the concept of reducing volume great so pato some of the things this is easier to have better control over the different volume levels of lightening up the more that you get experienced with this sound. So when you're first doing it and you're lightening up, you're gonna lose and reduce some of your volume. Then as you get more control over that lightening up, you're gonna to start to figure out how to accelerate some air through the different vibrational modes and add a little bit of volume to it. And you can also learn how to make some um, resonance uh, changes and end up getting uh, different results. But the key thing is with that as well is a lot. I hear a lot of people talk about this. That, well, eventually you want them all to be able to be full like, and then they'll name a certain singer. But you got to remember recordings are compressed. And so any recording that you're listening to, they use what's called a compressor, which uh, basically allows you to set a ceiling on how low, loud the vocal is going to get. And then allows you to lift the volume level of everything else up. So you could take a natural dynamic range that's this big and squash it down to be that big. And a perfect example would be like the song Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke. He starts off in a falsetto and then he goes to a belt and it sounds like the falsetto and the belt are the same volume level, but they're not. You can go watch him on Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy uh, Fallon, one of the Jimmys, and he's uh, uh, doing the little Tinker Toy Band and he sings the song and his falsetto is so much weaker than his full voice and you get to actually hear what's more like reality. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. When you're first starting to lighten up, you're going to reduce some of the volume because you're producing less of uh, the, what are called harmonics. Those are the frequencies that come off of your voice. And for uh, something to appear loud, that's going to usually have more energy in those upper harmonics. And if you're not pulling those vocal folds as firmly together, you're going to have less of that energy. So it's also going to appear a little bit quieter because of that as well. Boom. Okay, Pato, Matt just broke it down. <laughs> Literally, you have the acoustic... Uh, answer in terms of why it's softer so don't worry everyone it happens to every voice especially as you're just getting starting started on lightening up and like matt said the <laughs> all of the recordings trick us so what you're actually listening to is not reality on most of the uh, produced albums so let's jump into our next question here rena asks how does posture affect your voice so, Rena, just because uh, of the sake of time, I'm going to kind of just give you a brief uh, answer on this one. Um, the, the skeleton forms the structure of your instrument. And if the even the bottom of the, your structure, let's say one of your ankles leans in a little bit. When your ankle leans in a little bit, it ends up tilting your pelvis a little bit. And when your pelvis is tilted, then it tilts your uh, spine a little bit. 
And when your spine's tilted, well, that can end up tilting your rib cage a little bit. And then eventually it ends up over here behind the, um, uh, the vocal folds and the larynx and the vocal tract up here on the cervical vertebrae. They start to compensate, leaning your head forward or to a side or back. And as these vertebrae shift, they put pressure onto the larynx. We have MRI imaging that shows us that when people move their necks, their cervical vertebrae move as well. And if that starts happening, it's pushing on your larynx and it can knock it out of whack. So what I would encourage you to do is to look up body mapping. Body mapping by William Knobel is a discipline that's all about getting an accurate map of your body. And when you have an accurate map of your body, you're going to understand a lot more how posture is affecting your voice. And body mapping, you're going to learn about the six points of balance uh, of your skeleton. You're going to learn how to let your pelvis serve as a weight distributor to evenly distribute your upper body weight down into your legs. And then you're going to learn how to make sure you're standing uh, on the, the tripod of your feet to make sure that your feet are evenly distributing the weight. And when you get the weight evenly distributed on the lower half of your body, then it's going to be easier for your upper half of your body to balance. Your spine is made for each vertebrae to balance on the vertebrae below. And when you get yourself positioned right, it doesn't feel artificial. You're not using muscles you're not supposed to. Your spine just takes over the work. And when it takes over the work, your rib cage is in its optimal position. Your rib cage pivots uh, on the uh, thoracic vertebrae in your back or your lumbar vertebrae. Sorry, you know, your thoracic vertebrae in the back. There's little facets. And that's where your vertebrae or the, the ribs attach in the back. They attach to the costal cartilage in the front. And they move and lift up to inhale and to exhale. So we need the spine in decent alignment behind your rib cage so that that natural movement can happen. And then, of course, what we mentioned earlier with the cervical vertebrae not pushing on the larynx. Okay. Uh, you, that was a lot, guys. So if you want to learn more, I'm just going to flash this up. Uh, we have a great course called How the Voice Works. Uh, Matt actually breaks down so many aspects of actually how the voice works in this course and in it we have, have a whole chapter module on posture and so you get uh, videos all kinds of math why don't you tell them a little bit more about what's in the the course on that yeah it takes you through all the different parts of the body so or the instrument and then the one parts of the body that relate directly to that but really only the most important ones you need to know there's plenty of muscles we could go over but i try to just zone it into the things that i feel like if uh, my clients know they sing better so we go through this idea of posture we show you how to align your body we even show you stretches that you can use and give you a resource database where you can go look up any abnormalities you may notice in the way you stand and find out which stretches you're supposed to do to get your body back into balance uh, we go through and we talk about the power source of your instrument, which is the respiratory system. And I show you how the lungs work. We use this model back here and uh, you get some good close up images of uh, Patty LeBone, as my students like to call it. And uh, Patty LeBone uh, will let you see the diaphragm and see the lungs. And then I'll even show you some animation so you can see them in action. I'm going to talk to you about how to control your respiratory system for singing. Then we go into the vibratory mechanism, which are the vocal folds themselves. I walk through and I show you how to control the vocal folds and uh, to get this you know, chest register, head register mix and everything in between. And then we work our way up to the vocal tract and we start talking about how the, your larynx moves, how your soft palate moves, how your lips, jaw and tongue move. And I give you about 150 exercises that you can work through to drill all these different movement patterns. Uh, I give you guided listening where I just walk you through some of your favorite artists so you can start to identify what it is that you're hearing and be able to replicate that kind of a sound in your voice with your own version of that sound. And uh, there's even a pro vocal assessment that you can take where you can walk through and answer uh, some questions about what you either notice. Does your body look like this when you sing or do you hear this sound when you sing? And then it'll spit out a report that'll tell you how to use the course material to take your singing to the next level. Awesome. There's so much in there. It's hard to go over in just so we're going to move to our next question. But if you're interested, go check it out. It is on uh, launch special still, which we've extended through this whole COVID uh, period for only $47, but it's not going to last forever, guys. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Um, it's great for giving early beginner singers and singers of all levels a visual mental map 
of what their instrument is on the inside, kind of how it looks, how it works. Uh, and like Matt said, it helps every single one of his students sing better. So I couldn't recommend it more. If you're interested, go check that out. So let's go to our next question here. This one comes in from Shay. Um, and this is a you know question we don't get enough, but it does come in. And so I thought I'd include it because sometimes people are afraid to talk about this. And it's important that you know how it happens, why it happens, what to do. So uh, Shay asks, how do you know if your voice is damaged? So Matt, what do you have for this? How do we keep people's voices healthy? Yeah, so uh, it's hard to tell without going to a doctor. So people will often think that you can hear damage in the voice, and sometimes you can, but I've also had plenty of voices that I suspected had damage. I've sent them to go see a doctor and they've come back with nothing really except maybe a little acid reflux. It's just how their voice sounds. And so uh, we can't diagnose just off sound alone. At the same token, I've heard voices that sound incredible and uh, they say they've had uh, voice damage. You look at the photos and they do, yet they sound great. And so that can happen as well. Uh, the best way to figure out if you have the damage or not is to go to a laryngologist. A laryngologist is a medical doctor who went on to uh, do their specialty in otolaryngology, who then went on to do a further fellowship in laryngology. So this is somebody with years and years and years of schooling. And they're trained on how to use uh, stroboscopy equipment. And so there's two ways they can do this. They can numb your nose and take a teeny little camera and they can thread it through your nose and then tilt the camera down in the back and look right down at your vocal folds. And when they do that, they can watch how they are um, you know, functioning when you're making sound and they can see if there's anything that's off in the way that they're moving. They can also go through your mouth. They just hold up your tongue with some gauze and they stick a little thing into the back, again, teeny camera, and it views down at your vocal folds and that'll give them a lot of times a closer look at the folds themselves and a chance to look for any bumps along the surface or any what look like dried out areas, which can be scar tissue. If they notice something, 90% of the time or more, they're going to tell you that you need voice therapy. And they're going to have you work with a speech language pathologist who's going to work with you on your speaking patterns. Because what we're finding more and more is even in singers, a lot of times the issue that's giving them the vocal problems is directly related in some way to how they talk in their uh, everyday uh, work. They tend to be people who, you know, sing loud and talk loud. And it's the combination of singing and talking loud that's just wearing out their vocal folds. And they'll get some sort of a formation on the folds that's causing the folds not to come together and vibrate as efficiently as they should. Now, these little um, uh, lesions is what we call them, come in all kinds of shapes, literally. I mean, uh, you know, little teeny dots and then the more sack-like pouches. Sometimes they can be on the underside of the fold. Sometimes they're right on the edge of the fold. Sometimes it's only on one side of the fold. Other times it's on both of the folds at the same spot called bilateral lesions. But the voice therapy work will start to take away the pressure that's being put on that lesion. And a lot of times the body will just absorb that lesion and uh, you'll get back to yourself and your voice will be fine and you just keep going along on your way. And it's in very, very rare occasions that they may have to go in there and do surgery. But nowadays they do it with a tiny little scalpel. They have great outcomes or they go in there and they do it with a laser. And uh, again, they have great outcomes. So voice damage is not the end of the world. You just need to go get somebody to get some help with it. Uh, and you need to not be ashamed about it. One third of the general population has some sort of voice pathology. You can bust a blood vessel on your vocal folds uh, which is called hemorrhaging from choking on food, from coughing. So like, that's not even your fault. You didn't cause that, but it doesn't mean it's still not there, right? You could have a really emotional moment. Like let's say you see somebody about to run in front of a car and you scream their name because you're so scared to try to stop them. Well, in that minute, you could have just hemorrhaged a vocal fold. And again, not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. It was just a freak accident, but you need a doctor to help you figure out how to heal from it and to make sure you take good care of it. So Shay, seek out a laryngologist, uh, get a scope, and uh, they'll be able to fill you in on the rest from there. Absolutely. And we recommend a annual yearly vocal health checkup. So yep. uh, talk to your local laryngologist, fig figure out when to get scheduled and go in and get those as soon as this uh, pandemic is finally wrapped up. So yeah. 
Um, okay, so next question comes in. I think this will be the last one. I'll check the chat again. This one comes in from Beth. Should you sit or stand while singing? And this one, it's like, this is a true question because if you're in front of a piano, you know, like a grand piano, I have yet to see a standing grand piano, but maybe they're out there. Maybe they're out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's really, it's what you just said, Mike. I mean, a lot of it, Beth, depends on what you're doing. Um, if you are, you know, playing piano, then you have no choice but to sit and sing. And yes, you can learn how to do that. Unless it's an electric, electric keyboards. You yeah, can get then you lift piano. it up. Yeah. Right. And uh, but what you need to do, though, is you need to really get on your sits bones, the bottom pelvic bones and keep your pelvis balanced on the chair. So the rest of your body can then balance down on the thoracic vertebrae and into your pelvis. That way, your upper body stays aligned. Now, your lower body does connect to, uh, you know, your upper body. And we have a muscle called the psoas muscle that connects to the same vertebrae as the uh, diaphragm. And it's part of me. It's because of those lower body connections that a lot of teachers will tell you that you're going to get your best singing while standing. So in general, standing is usually the better uh, way to be if you're, you know, working on your voice. And I even say this to piano players is to, you know, stand up and vocalize, then sit down and play your song and try to notice what changes in between the two. Singing is an athletic activity. And if you can have your body fully engaged, that usually gives us a better desired outcome. But that depends what you're trying to do. If you sing a really breathy, really indie emo kind of a sound, and it's you playing your guitar hunched over and, you know, doing like the dark goth thing, then maybe that totally fits what you want. And in that instance, the sitting's fine. But if you're trying to sit down and lean over a guitar and sing operatically, it's not going to work. To get that great operatic tone, you need your whole body involved. So you're going to have to get up and stand. So in general, standing is better. Sitting works. We can sit on a bar stool and play guitar. We can sit on a piano bench and play guitar. But it's usually good for those singers to still get on their feet and vocalize while standing so they can really learn and uh, understand their voice. Great. Okay. And Wendy Jones says, Amen. <laughs> All Thanks right. Thanks for stopping by, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. All right. Uh, Matt, one more. Let's squeeze in one more. It's the last one. Um, thanks. Okay. Veronica writes in, what is belting and is it safe for my voice? This could be an entire show. So uh, okay. again, right. for the Maybe sake of a five-minute answer. Yeah, we'll give you the short answer here, Veronica. Uh, first of all, belting is safe. It's not hurting your voice. In fact, what we know is that indigenous cultures throughout the world uh, use a vocal production that here in the United States we would label as belting. And they've been doing it for millennia, and they're still able to sing. So belting is actually a very natural part of what we're designed to do as a species. And so we shouldn't be afraid of it. Belting comes in all different weights, just like weighted blankets. You can have a light weighted blanket that you can kind of toss on, but you could also have a really heavy weighted blanket. And we know that a light blanket, if you just drop the lighter weighted blanket, it's not going to make as much sound as if you drop the big 25 pounder. It makes a big thud. So the thicker the vocal folds, usually the bigger the belt, and the thinner the vocal folds, the lighter the belt. It doesn't mean that if you put those two singers next to each other, that one is belting and one's not. They could both be belting, but one might sound really light and really mixy, and the other one might almost sound like a chainsaw, you know, have that real metallic kind of a sound to it. So we have to realize there's a spectrum, and there's every color in between. I like to define belting uh, by ideas about the story. So to me, belting is most similar to calling out. And so in what moments in life would we be calling out? So maybe a moment of grief, maybe a moment of excitement, maybe a moment of anger, maybe a moment of like intensity if you really trying to drive home a point. Well, if we want to sing about one of those moments, we need our vocal folds to take on that same calling uh, instinct that we would hear in natural speech. And when we get that calling feel in a high intensity emotional state of being, then that's usually what's going to be perceived as a belt. Now, people belt with warm vowels, nasal vowels, bright vowels, and everything in between. So the vowel quality doesn't totally define it, right? If it starts getting towards Italianate vowels in foreign languages, it might end up just sounding like a dramatic opera singer, but I've also heard Italian singers felt perfectly fine in Italian, right? You'll know 
that it's high, it's exciting, and it is definitely not a classical operatic sound. Now, how does that, how do we produce that sound? It's a combination of stuff that's happening at the vocal fold level and in the vocal tract. Again, the vocal tract is everything from the vocal folds to the opening of the lips. When the vocal folds come together firmly enough, they produce a lot of frequencies. We call those frequencies that spread off from the note you're singing and all the different frequencies above it, overtones or harmonics. And what happens is when you then form your vowel, you amplify some of those harmonics. And if you amplify the right combination of harmonics that are being produced by the right closure of the vocal folds, you're going to get that high intensity ringing sound that we call belt. Um, the place that people end up getting in trouble is they carry up too much thickness, like we talked about earlier in the show. And they carry up and it ends up sounding like a yell. So a yell is, hey, a call is, hey, hey, mom. That's a call. Hey, mom is yelling. Okay. So we want the calling, not the yelling. The yelling is screaming. That's not belting. The calling is under control. And that's where more of the belt lives. So belting based off of a safe and healthy call that's in line with your primal instinct, the uh, traits that have been passed down by millennia of ancestors, then that is perfectly safe for your voice. And uh, if you're trying to figure it out on your own, I would say that that's a little bit riskier than figuring it out with an experienced teacher who's used to teaching belters. So Veronica, if you're worried about it, find a voice teacher who specializes in teaching belters and you're going to be good to go. You know, this question is such an important question. It's kind of like belting. Some people might think it's taboo. That's why it comes up. But I think it really helps the you know uh, singers really tap into the chest voice because if you don't have a strong chest voice, you could be missing half your voice. <laughs> if yeah. you don't have really good strong arrhythmoids, um, not that everyone needs to you know have a zip up you know type technique, but. You definitely, as you mentioned, you got to go down there and embrace that. So definitely check this out. Find a coach, um, Veronica. Hopefully that helps you and answers your question. Let me check the chat here. Oh, we got one more question from Pato, Matt. Let's see. This one. Okay, this will be our last question, guys, and we're going to wrap up. So Pato writes, would exercising with primal sounds help learning how to belt? Absolutely. Good call, Pato. Um, yep. So you would, I like to use sometimes, hey, mom, and just tell students, excuse me, I want you to vary the pitch range that you do it. So go, hey, mom, hey, mom, hey, mom, hey, mom, hey, mom, and just play around with that. Or call your best friend's name or go team, go hornets, try different words and see what it's like to do those call variations without just screaming. And then eventually take one of those word phrases like, hey, mom and put it into an exercise. Hey, mom. Hey, mom. Hey, mom. And then you just carry that up. So, yep, absolutely. Use primal instinct and calling as a way to start developing that belt voice. Awesome. It's working, Matt. They're learning stuff from us. I okay. know. It's exciting. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. If you have some questions, please drop them in. Uh, we're happy to um, answer your questions. Every week we go live. Um, I know summer's been, so we've had a couple vacations. But um, everyone, I just want to say thanks for tuning in tonight. Drop us in your questions, and uh, we'll see you next week. Great. Bye, see everybody. you next week. Good night. Good night.